Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are director-writer Brandon David and singer-performer Susan Egan. Filmmaker Brandon David was born and raised in Bristol, Connecticut. He graduated from the New York University Film and TV program in 1998, hoping for a career in filmmaking. <laughs> he finished his three-picture deal, which is what I think all directors get, but this deal was like no other. Let's start with your first job. Where was that? My first job? Yeah. I don't know if I'd call it a job, but... Uh, <laughs> After high school. Leaving high school, I was stealing cars and selling <laughs> marijuana, transporting it across the country. <laughs> That's what I meant, your yeah. first job. Yeah. From California to Connecticut? Mm-hmm. And how did that uh, fit into your lifestyle? It's hard to look at you and think you can say things like that. Well, uh, leaving high school, I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know that I wanted to go to college. So uh, I kind of took a few years off, and that's what I ended up doing. But on those trips across the country, we came to California and Los Angeles, and I got inspired to uh, get involved in the film industry. Is that what happened? Yeah. When you get, we talk about Connecticut, mm -hmm. about being, to me, it's like this super white, suburb mm -hmm. and to hear you describe Connecticut is yeah. so different from anything we've ever thought of and I don't even know where Bristol is yeah most people think of Connecticut they think of Fairfield County and Greenwich oh that's why and the well-groomed lawns and the nice suburbs but Bristol is more of like I call it a white trash wasteland a lot of people that live there get angry at me for saying that but that's but where I grew up there. yeah that's where I grew up and that's kind of my opinion of that area. Central Connecticut is very run down. So it's central. Mm -hmm. So it's just, uh, what, two hours from New York? Yes. And and you were telling me Bristol is known, as, nobody knows it except? It's the home of ESPN. So that's where most people know Bristol, Connecticut from. Are more commercial building, building going on there? Are they moving out? Because it must be close in, actually, you know, when things start moving away. Yeah, you mean for, for Bristol? For business. business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ESPN's pretty much growing in uh, in Bristol. I think they're staying put. And and mm. is anything else coming in? Do you know? Not that I know of. There's um, you know, a lot of manufacturing that has gone away, oh, which it went has left away? a lot of people jobless and oh. left a lot of like turned a lot of people into alcoholics. And I think that's where a lot of the drug traffic comes into Bristol. So growing up in high school, uh, myself and a lot of my friends got involved in drug trafficking because of the high demand for marijuana and other narcotics in town. But not with kids, per mm -hmm. se. You're talking about kids. older people, right? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely a demand from the uh, middle-aged and middle-aged crowd, like people that are out of work or working a very depressing blue-collar factory job. Mm -hmm. How long were you in California before <clears throat> you decided on a career? Um, a couple of weeks, really. That's all? Yeah, plus the driving across the country with the marijuana and thinking about how cool it would be to make a movie about what we're doing instead of actually doing it. Did you really think about that? Mm -hmm, I did. So you, in your mind, mm -hmm. all this time when you were in high school, probably with <clears throat> thinking, were you writing stories? No, um, I was doing some filmmaking though. You were? I used to ride BMX bikes like the X Games. Uh -huh. And I started my filmmaking career by making videos of uh, my team and I doing tricks. Oh, you did? You know, I would edit them and send them out to sponsors, and that's how I started filmmaking. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. So your first fi feature, so we're going to talk about your three, your, your three film okay. deal, <laughs> which all has to do with you, yeah. right? Yeah. It's all about you. I'm the you. only one they gave me the three-picture deal. <laughs> you gave it to yourself? Yeah. King Midas, right? Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Um, <clears throat> King Midas was the first film I did out of NYU. And um, I basically financed it with my friends who were still in the <laughs> marijuana business. <laughs> That's and what was so funny. <laughs> they had a lot of extra money and time and vehicles and all that. So we made this like urban action movie. Where'd you do it? We did that in Hartford, Connecticut. 
and um, who wrote it? I wrote it, directed it, produced it, edited, and uh, we sold it to. Uh, we got a good DVD distribution deal and made some money on it, so that kind of gave me some momentum. Well, tell us about King Midas. Was it a personal experience? <clears throat> was King it something that you personally were attached to? It was. It was loosely based on some kids that I had went to high school with who were sent to jail for coke dealing. So King Midas was loosely based on friends that I had grown up with in Bristol. Did any of these kids mm -hmm. in, in like your second film and your Bristol Boys mm -hmm. and Six Figures see themselves and get upset about this? Most of them were in it. That's what, so you mean <laughs> acting in it? Yeah, there, a lot of the real guys that it was based on were in the films, except for the latest film, Bristol Boys. There are uh, some guys that ratted everyone out and their story was told, so they didn't like the way that they were portrayed in the film. But, um, you know. So the second film, luck. second film, you got a good mm -hmm. DVD uh, distribution on King mm -hmm. Midas. So that afforded you the luxury of making your second film, which was yes. what, Six Figures? Yeah, it was called Six Figures. It's a heist movie in a strip club. One of the guys. Heist? We, heist, yeah, heist movie. <laughs> And um, it's a fun action movie. Um, a bunch of people that work in a strip club rob it on a Friday night. And uh, very low budget, but again, we got a good deal for the movie. We got a DVD distribution deal and made money on it. And again, it kept the momentum going. You know, was it a personal money. experience? No, that was more of a movie that I wrote no based on. No strip clubs in Bristol? Uh, no, but very close by. <laughs> Actually, a friend of mine owns the strip club that it was filmed in. So. Is that right? Yeah. Was that was in Connecticut too? It's in Massachusetts. Oh, it's in Massachusetts. Yeah. Okay, so did you, you <clears throat> pay the, all of your investors back by the, the time you made the second film, right? Yeah, on the first two movies, they got paid back, and um, that's how we got the financing for Bristol Boys. So tell us about Bristol Boys. Mm -hmm. You wrote it yourself. Mm -hmm. It says, Bristol Boys, in a small town, drug dealer dealing is big business. Right. Based right. on a true story. Bristol Boys is based on the friends of mine that I grew up with who uh, got busted by the DEA and the FBI for running a large-scale marijuana enterprise. And when we talk about large-scale, how large-scale? Pretty large-scale. These guys were selling like 100 pounds a pot a month, and they were having it shipped in via FedEx and UPS. So and just simple. Yeah, they very had a simple. simple operation. Very well, simple but pretty large scale, you know. And what um, do you mean right under everybody's nose is yeah. what I meant. Yeah, and a lot of the custom, a lot of their customers were middle-aged factory worker, construction worker type of guys. This wasn't like a distribution network going through the high schools, which is why I say that Bristol and Central Connecticut area <clears throat> has a very high demand for marijuana and narcotics, and mm -hmm. it's not coming from not totally coming from the high schools. Did, did you uh, write mm. yourself into this movie? Are you one of the characters? Yeah. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> no. Like, uh, like uh, when I left that world, per se, to pursue my filmmaking career, I sort of became an outsider. Uh huh. Uh, although when I would go home and visit, I was part of the gang, you know, but I just wasn't caught up in the business. How long did it take you to, I'm going <coughs> to hold this up in okay. case they don't see the poster behind you. Mm -hmm. How long does it, did it take you to write and uh, film this? I wrote the script in about three weeks, the first draft, and then I took it through a couple of screenwriting workshops. And, oh, you uh, did? Yeah. So about a year later after I wrote the first draft, a year and a half, we were shooting the film. Do you think it's important to go through those? Uh, those film workshops? I think it is. I think Did it you, help you? It helped me quite a bit. I took one at UCLA. Uh huh. They say that one is great. That one's great. It's <coughs> it's just an honest program. There are a lot of salesmen that'll try to get you to sign up for these like screenwriting boot camps. Oh uh, yeah. M my personal opinion, I think those are a ripoff. But I think any filmmaker that's going to make their first feature, they should definitely go through some sort of the school S yeah, situation. Yeah, school or work with a, you know, I work with Hollywood readers, people that read screenplays oh for yeah. studios. I see. I pay them for their advice too. Oh, so that's really, uh, that's good. Mm -hmm. That was good for you. Uh, how did you cast it then? Because you've got like some really good people and you were surprised yourself, you said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was surprised. Uh, I made friends with some of the uh, actors that are in the film. The lead is Thomas Guyrie who was recently on The Black Donnellys and in Mystic River. Oh, yeah. And Dean Winters and David Zayas, who are both on Oz. 
and Will Janowitz and Max Casella, who were on The Sopranos. So at the time, you know, these guys were all on TV shows, and I just made friends with one of them, and then that one gave the script to the other one, and that one gave the script to the next so one. So that's how you did it? Yeah, before I knew it, I had it, the whole cast. I love, I, <coughs> I don't want to uh, pass over this, because I think your premiere in New York was so great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that you do say in Bristol Boys is that you don't glorify drugs, right? right, right. It's not like about how great it is to be. No, it's unlike a lot of other films, it doesn't glorify the drug dealing business. It shows how the main character gets caught up in that world because uh -huh. it's exciting and because it could get him the women and the cars and stuff. But it's also very realistic in its portrayal. This guy's not making a million dollars overnight like they are in a lot of drug dealing movies. So, you know? so, so your premiere <coughs> had all yeah. of these guys, mm -hmm. and what'd you do? Just open it to anybody? What, how'd you do your your premiere? Oh uh, well, we premiered like for the people, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, we premiered the film in Bristol, and it was that we had a couple of oversold screenings. <clears throat> of course, in Bristol, Connecticut, if there's a movie that comes out called Bristol Boys <laughs> and it right. has a cast from Oz and the Sopranos, right. every kid and their brother is going to want to see the movie. I'll show just a couple of these. Uh, so, but but I think what you said, you just had like beer and mm -hmm. stuff like that. It was just like a yeah. I mean, you know, there's no uh, Hollywood premiere with a red carpet for I mean. a film like this. <laughs> that's what I meant. You know, yeah. we got our DVD release and um, had a couple theatrical screenings. And who's and this? That's David Zayas, who's currently on Dexter on Showtime. Um, that's David facing us. Um, here he is again. That's Thomas Guyrie in the middle from Mystic River and on the Black Donnellys. <coughs> and uh, again, that's David Zayas. Plays a detective in the film. And Will Janowitz from The Sopranos. He plays the main character's friend who's like kind of gets suckered into everything. We showed that one, didn't yeah. we? That's also <coughs> Thomas Guyry again, who's, uh, if anyone's seen Mystic River, he's great in Mystic River. That was a Julie, mm. Julia Roberts was on that? This is uh, Max Casella, and he was on Doogie Howser. Most people oh, remember right. him from Doogie Howser and The Sopranos. So we got your three films. What's mm -hmm. the next one? The next one is called Lord of Lies, and it's based on a novel that some of my friends wrote. It's about the investigation of a murder in a high school. But not in Bristol. Not in Bristol, no. The first first movie that's not based on my, you know, sort of upbringing and hometown. Do you think you've covered <coughs> it all in Bristol? Um, unless I want to make a movie about ESPN, yeah, I think oh, I've then. pretty much <laughs> checked it all off. <laughs> I've got the Coke dealer and the marijuana dealer, uh, the heroin dealer. I haven't done that one uh, yet. Maybe that'll we'll be We'll pencil nice. that in for uh, 2010. Okay, thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Joan. Thank you, and we'll be right back with Susan Egan. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with singer-performer Susan Egan, who was born and raised in Southern California and attended the Orange County High School of the Arts, UCLA, where she, and also UCLA, where she received uh, the Carol Burnett Award in Musical Theater. To prove the faculty at UCLA was right, Susan went on to Broadway and starred in Thoroughly Modern Millie, Beauty and the Beast, and Cabaret. She's guest starred on lots of TV shows, movies of the week, and many specials for ABC, CBS, and Disney. Susan, you're a hometown gal. How did you find Broadway? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? People yes. always ask because they don't think of Southern California as really a theater-oriented place, but you know, Joan, there are more theaters in Southern California per capita than any other place in the United States. Ra ra. Yes. I'm for you. I love that. And so I was brought up going to the theater, very lucky, um. but then I took advantage of all the local theaters, the Civic Light Operas in Downey and La Mirada oh. and Long Beach and uh, community theaters, and then, of course, I was lucky enough to go to the Orange County High School of the Arts. Did you have to um, 
Um, audition, to audition get yeah, thanks. Yes. Audition for that. Well, it was much easier to get in the School of the Arts in the 80s than it is now. Now, kids come from 90 cities, uh, you know, across oh, the do? Southland. From all over? And thousands of, of kids audition every year. In fact, I went back a couple years ago and became the artistic director for a year, and I was astounded with the talent, and I was so grateful that that they weren't there when I was there. <laughs> I don't know that I ever would have made it. I They're was, so good. I was going to ask you because you took two years out of your career That's to go right. back. And what made you do that? You know, well, um, I was doing a sitcom for two years. And um, this is in 2001 after September 11th. And when the sitcom uh, went away, I sort of was figuring out what I wanted to do. And I, and I think I just wanted to get back to my roots a little bit. And, and stay here. Yeah. And that teacher that made that big difference in my life was a gentleman named Ralph Opasic. And he's the head of the School of the Arts. And he took me out to lunch one day to pick my brain because they needed to make some changes at the school. And we just hit it off so much that, um, that I decided to go in for a year, restructure the departments, um, and rewrite the curriculum for the theater department in particular, bring in some new faculty. But that was great because great. you'd already been on Broadway and you'd been doing thing so you were a real asset then to the school well thank you so much <laughs> but yes. isn't that right well and part of the idea was to finally bridge the gap between the school and the industry and so right. I was really lucky I got to bring in a lot of my um, my colleagues uh, Broadway actors I even got to bring in uh, Jerry Herman to do master classes you mean to at do class oh that was yeah. great yeah so it's great and, and that's teach? continued and and to teach exactly. classes or to teach a semester or what he came in for a master class he and did, did a concert but yeah other the uh, other theater people <laughs> yes came into t um, Terry Ralston, who's a Broadway star. She came in and, w and became, um, she directed two plays there, and oh. she was a, a teacher three times a week there for music theater classes. Um, some incredible people have, have gone in. When you were at the Orange County um, School of the Arts, did you get all the training you needed, or were you taking acting classes and dancing besides? It's interesting, because I'm a big fan of UCLA as well. However, oh yeah, you went to UCLA. However, um, I feel, and especially now with the kids graduating from the school now, I feel like really you should enter college as a junior or a senior in the musical theater classes because you're getting all the training at OSHA, at the School of the Arts. And in fact, when I went to UCLA, I was a theater major only for my first year, and then I switched to anthropology. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, and I did, I did Why, plays at UCLA. Why, because you knew so, you thought you knew yeah. it all, or well, what? No, not that I knew it all, but, but I felt like um, the first two years of classes were a little bit of a repeat, and so I continued training, oh, but oh. I took advantage of being in Los Angeles. I took acting um, with Milton Caselis, and oh, I took yeah. dance here here in Los Angeles, and I had a voice teacher here in Los Angeles, oh, and and then I took other kinds of classes in so college. So you were at UCLA, and you were still doing, because that yeah. is very important. That obviously must have put you to the top, so that you could go to Broadway. Well, you need <sighs> that I never extra thought of that then, but it, I, yeah, I guess you? it helped. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you need that extra little push. I think also, the more different kinds of things you do, the more people you meet. And yeah, like exactly. any industry, it's it's the people that you get to know. So in fact, That's having true. mentioned Terry Ralston, you know, she was in two original Sondheim pieces on Broadway mm -hmm. in the original cast of Company, the original cast of Little Night Music. When I was a sophomore in college, she directed me in, in No No Nanette at La Mirada Light Opera. And her agent saw the show and he signed me. and. While I was in your green room, I just had a conversation with him. He's still my agent today. Is that right? And so you never and know so you meet those who you're people. going to meet and yeah. how they're going to change your life. That's exactly right. Well, how did it feel being the longest Sally Bowles on Broadway? <laughs> <laughs> it, well, it's my favorite show I've ever done. Next to, I'm sure, how I will feel about chess. chess right. But it was incredible. Sam Mendes is a knockout director. In fact, because of Cabaret, um, Steven uh, Spielberg gave him a movie to direct. Sam right. had never directed a film before. He directed oh, American Beauty oh, yeah. because of the production of Cabaret, and he won the Oscar for Best Director because of it. I mean, he's that good. And you had him. And I had him. That was Not in the great. biblical sense, Joan, but I had him and his intellect and talent in the directorial sense. And um, and he's he made me a better actor than any acting class I've ever had. It's kind of hard for me to say, how did you keep Sally alive day after day, seeing you because you're you know, so full of energy? I'm oh, sure that so, it was you know, easy. I think it's because... Uh, <laughs> I played so many good girls with Belle, with Nanette, <laughs> with, um, right. with Millie, with all these good, sweet, wholesome girls. So to get to play Sally Bowles, who's a heroin addict, who's, who's um, <laughs> you know, an alcoholic, I just think I had a blast going to town. I did the show almost two years. I know. It's amazing. I loved it. I loved it. Did you it. sing it in your sleep? Oh, my gosh. Yes. <laughs> I still do. In fact, I had a concert. Do you? 
I had a concert with the San Diego Symphony this weekend, and it, you know, the songs from Beauty and the Beast and the songs from Cabaret, I think I will be singing for the they rest of my life. They just come to you, though, yeah. right? When yeah. you stand up there. And, and you do a lot. You sing with a lot of orchestras. Yes. And you sing, you've sang at where? Carnegie Hall and different. Yeah, um, Kennedy Center, Kennedy. like the Hollywood Bowl three or four times. Yeah. And with orchestras and those kind of songs that you're known for? Yes. Is that what happens? And there is nothing. <laughs> see, on Broadway, yeah. you're lucky if you have 15 to 20 musicians. But with an orchestra, you've got 80 pieces behind you, Joan. 80 pieces playing cabaret. I was going to ask you about that. I was going to say, how does it you. feel? Well, it on nights when you don't you, have energy, right. it gives you all the energy you need. Hearing that, just it's great. The, the, just the music. Yeah, it jolts you. It goes through your body. They're so loud. And they're right behind you. It's like, oh, it's a great energy. So, who co-starred with you in Cabaret? Oh, well, the first time, oh, you had Michael C. Hall, who oh. is now on Dexter, ooh, on Showtime. Yeah. It's creepy. His first creepy role was the MC, as a matter of fact, oh, in Cabaret. Oh, he played the MC? Yes, he played the MC, and then um, because of that, he, that's how he got cast on um, Six Feet Under, uh -huh. and now he's on Dexter, so Michael C. Hall. And then um, I closed the show <gasps> with... Um, that all came around, too. American yeah. Beauty, Alan Ball. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Okay. Sam Go introduced on. Alan to Michael Hall. And, and there that, you are. And there okay. you are. I All know, right. it's Go very on. incestuous. You're do another, yeah. another and then, circle. And then I closed <laughs> the show. Um, I, I then left for four years, and then I came back, and I did the show for another year. And I got to do the show with Adam Pascal, who was the original Roger in Rent. Oh. And he played the MC, and it was very So cool. did, does that make a difference when you're playing? Does it make yeah. a difference who you're co-starring with? It absolutely with? does. And you know what I find is when you're in a long-running show, I like when the cast changes up because... You know, you've done a show 700 times. It's fun when a new guest on or a new beast comes into the show and kind of, you know, freshens things up and, and uh, you get a new take on it. It's almost and, like a whole new life. And talking about a new beast, you were nominated for a Tony for Beauty yes. and the Beast. For Belle. That's what right. What does Belle do? Belle is the girl. She's the girl who trades her life for her father and befriends she this hideous the, beast oh, right. and shows the world that he's actually beautiful on the inside, which then makes him beautiful on the outside, too. So you got to waltz with him on stage? I did. I have <laughs> costumes that are now in the Smithsonian. Really? Uh-huh. Beautiful ball gowns, like every girl dreams of. And you're dancing and singing. Yes. How are you doing it? Oh, my goodness. I love it. It's easy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it sure beats sitting in an office, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing, no, I meant physically, how do you do it? Oh, gosh. You know, um, actually, I, a lot of yoga, a lot of, I go to the do gym. You? Yeah, you? a lot yeah. of things to keep my stamina up. Do you up. still take dancing lessons all the time? Yeah. You, yeah. you probably have to, right? Yeah. Otherwise, I think you have to. And I had a baby, so I had to get back I into know. shape. So <laughs> Little Nina? I, little Nina, bless you for knowing that. So yes. cute. Little Nina, she's six months old. And um, she, yes, she's dancing yet, <laughs> singing. She's vocalizing. I'll Poor tell you that. Kid. <laughs> Poor child. What is, it, is her father so in show business? He's on the other end of it. He's on the production side. Oh, he good. he um, in the comedy industry actually. He he does shows for HBO and Comedy Central. Oh, produces. that's good. So yeah. he can get her a role in something like that. No, no, oh. no, no. We're pushing math and science. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah, you were so <laughs> successful. You didn't need math. No and science. actors. No, no, no. <laughs> but, no show you business. know, you got that Carol Burnett award and then you got to be on stage with her yes. at and the Tabor you, was it that's right I did putting it together for Stephen Sondheim at the Mark Tabor <laughs> Forum so with good. Carol Burnett and on the first day of rehearsal I was so excited to tell her oh my gosh Ms. Right. Burnett I I won your scholarship at school and you know she beat me to it that's how she classy knew she it? is she says Susan I'm so excited to work with you because you had my scholarship and I just thought I want to be like you. She's so grounded and so personable and so generous, gregarious, Isn't that marvelous, great? talented, beautiful soul. She is such a role model. That such is, a role model. That is so great to yeah. hear, isn't it? And as an actress, it must have done everything for you. I mean, well, you, you were in know. college. You've met a lot of people where, you know, their attitude isn't quite in the right place. So to meet someone like Carol Burnett where you think, well, she, you know, she's earned the right to be a bit of a diva and then she's not a diva. She's just wonderful that's and warm. That's why she is where she is. And you're going to be where you are in chess because you're giving <gasps> yes. your time for a charity. Yeah, Broadway Cares, Equity Fights, AIDS. Anybody who's been on Broadway. Um, you guys all do that. You're yeah. so wonderful well, about it. Well, you know, I've been in this industry 15 years and I've lost a lot of friends. And it's a horrible thing when I sit there and think, you know, what would Howard Ashman have written by now? Oh, you know, know, he's the lyricist of, and writer right. of, of Beauty and the Beast, and I never even met him. 
he was already gone by the time we did it on Broadway. And yet his spirit is so alive in that show and his talent was so incredible. And so in any case, it's, it's something that I think a lot of times in this country, people feel we've gotten a hold of this disease and we have not. We're still losing friends and talented, beautiful people to this. And so it's important to keep the awareness up and to raise money. And did you know chess? So Have you ever yes. been Yes. As a matter of oh, fact, you were? On one, I've never done the production, but on one of my oh, CDs so far, one? the purple one, purple one, which I recorded at this Abbey Road one? Studios in London. In London. Um, the duet that, um, that I'll be singing in chess with Cindy Robinson, I sang that with a woman named Lisa Richard on that CD. And, so uh, you know the music. Yeah, I love the music. It's ABBA. Ah, oh, it rocks. Truly. And so that, I don't know, that's one of the plays I don't know. It's just. great. Well, it was such a success that ABBA decided to put together another musical, which is Mamma Mia, which is one of the biggest hits on Broadway they history. Came out of that? So, yes, oh, yes. I know that. We love, yeah. we love Mamma Mia. Love it. And you did, so I'm just holding these up because you've done well, so let's many see, CDs. Th this one is coffee. <laughs> see, my hair is different in each one. You can yeah. tell I was doing Cabaret when I recorded that one. My hair was black. I was doing Millie when red. I recorded that one. My hair was red bobbed. And this one I recorded last year when I was pregnant, which is why it's a close-up of only my face. <laughs> And that's a holiday CD. So the fundraiser is at the Ford Amphitheater. That's right. September 17th. It's chess with an all-star Broadway cast. I know. One night only. Have you worked with those people before? Yes, I've worked with Cindy Robinson, who I love and adore. She's Kevin Early, who's been on your yes, show here. and Cindy's been on, too. There you go. Kevin and I did Thoroughly Modern Millie on Broadway together. And Eric Kunze, who is so gorgeous and has the most beautiful voice on the face oh, of the planet. he's good, too. He and I did South Pacific together. <gasps> I've, it's you've a very small so world. You've done so much. I can't believe it. It's an amazing, it. And you've amazing done cast. animation movies. Yes. A lot of Disney animation. Hercules and, and Ooh, the Miyazaki it. movies. And you got, yeah, the Miyazaki mu movies, which yeah. you translated from Japanese. Uh, you that, didn't well, translate somebody else the translated Japanese. them, but I spoke them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, Spirited Away won the Oscar for Best, pic for, and, uh, best and, Animated and that Feature. Was, and what did you do in that? I played a character named Lynn, who's kind of a, a sassy, streetwise girl. How does she sound? Kind of like this. And She's really snobby and kind of sarcastic, which I guess and they it was like Japanese me to do. animation. Japanese animation. We translated it into English, which is crazy because it was written. I mean, it was it was drawn to go with the Japanese words, so we have to fit oh, the right. English language into it and somehow make it sound natural. It's fun. <laughs> That was fun. And on Lady and the Tramp? Yes, Lady and the Tramp. I played Angel, a little beautiful little white dog who, um, who befriends uh, Scamp, who is uh, Tramp's son, which was very cool. Well, we're so glad you came with us because we've heard Thank Susan you. Egan's name for years and years. Well, I am here full time now, so have me back any time. I'd love to come and visit you again. Thank you. Thank you, and, and come see chess. Thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa. 44th floor. Bye.